Good morning. It's good to have everybody here this morning. I trust you guys had a good week and a good week weekend. So uh, welcome to Living Hope. And uh, thank you for coming out and sharing a little bit of time with us here this morning. As Before we get started, I'll go through some uh, housekeeping items here just really quick. And uh, we'll go from there. So um, just a... Uh, Kind of a, a thank you to the church. Our church donated 71 Operation Christmas Child Shoe Boxes. Just a good and a thank you to your generosity to um, everyone that provided that um, for them kids. And then also, uh, Bob wanted to remind me after um, service today, we have choir practice. So um, just if you're involved with choir practice, please that, keep that in mind also. And then uh, women's Bible study will not meet here in December just uh, because of holiday stuff and everything going on, um, just so you know, you've got that on the calendar. And then also, uh, Wednesday, December 13th, youth group, um, we'll have a, a meal here, and then um, if you have any kids that are um, involved with that, or you have kids that can be involved with that, um, get with Jeremy or Amy, um, and uh, go from there, I guess. So, I just got really hot. Okay, not hot that way, my mic got really hot. I don't know what them guys doing back there. Anyway, um, whew, that sounds really hot up here. Uh, so uh, then, uh, yeah, Wednesday, December 13th, Living Hope Church. Um, also here we have the Awana Kids also. If you have kids pre-K through 6, um, you guys can uh, um, bring them kids also and be involved in them um, activities. Um, so uh, then also uh, Monday, December 18th, um, we have a card party. We'll be sending Christmas cards to re recipients of the Thanksgiving meal. So if you were part of that, basically here in November, we provided meals for um, shut-ins and people that can't get around very well for Thanksgiving. And um, they're going to get cards together for that and uh, provide a, um, just a neat little deal of Christmas cards for them. So. I think that's about it. it um, we're blessed to have uh, Kim Crawford here with um, the director of Circle of Freedom. I'm going to have her come up. We took an offering up for her and her organization. Come on up, Kim. And uh, she wants to share a little bit about that. So, Good morning. I'm Kim Crawford. I'm director of the Circle of Freedom. And I'm very thankful for the opportunity to come and personally thank you for the very generous donation that you gave to Circle of Freedom and to show you just a little bit more about what your gift is at work doing. Um, our mission is leading women that are struggling with life-controlling addictions to freedom in Jesus and then helping them to reestablish their lives. In 2012, I was given the opportunity to start meeting with women at the county jail, and it quickly expanded to mentoring um, after they were released and also with women that would contact us outside the jail system. I immediately realized that these women desperately need a safe place to heal and grow with the Lord. In 2021, we purchased our building in Seymour to open a residential home for those who need more intensive help. It offers women a place to get um, grounded in their faith, find Christ-centered solutions to addiction, and begin life reestablishment. Our home is modeled after the Adult and Teen Challenge program, and we use their curriculum. They have over 60 years of experience and some of the highest success rates for people maintaining their sobriety. Their success is attributed to the biblical-based teaching and also the restoration power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Our center can help um, handle up to 12 women, and it's a 12 to 15-month program. Our building is very structurally sound, but um, it required major renovations due to its age and also a season of no heat prior to our purchase. And so I wanted to just have them scroll through some pictures of what our building looked like before we renovated and what it looks like now. This has all been accomplished um, without incurring any debt because of generous donations like yours and also over 6,000 hours of volunteer labor on the building. It turned out better than we could have ever imagined. We had so many things. Almost everything you see in the pictures was donated to us. Kitchen cabinets, flooring, appliances, bedroom sets, and gently used furniture throughout the home. So we opened with our first students in September. We have three students now and another one arriving this Tuesday. 
Last Sunday, we celebrated our first three students who were all baptized. And we will be, um, it was a really great celebration. <laughs> so exciting. Um, we're going to continue to add students monthly and to, so that we'll have them all spread out throughout the program. Our thrift shop in the east wing of our building is operated by volunteers, and our students also work along with the volunteers. Um, and we are just finishing up our five apartments, partially because of your donation. And so here are a few pictures of those apartments. These will be housing for our house grandmothers, who will provide a special kind of mentorship and be like family to our students. Um, the rent from the apartments will provide a vital resource of income to help support the center. Many ministries like ours are almost 100% donor supported. But with our thrift shop and the apartment rent income, we can be 50% self-supported. We can't thank you enough for your very generous donation to Circle of Freedom. You're not investing in a building or a ministry, but you're investing in lives and souls for eternity. Um, when God gave us this building, I was like, oh, it's so overwhelmed really with the whole thing. But he said, he told me, I'll be the builder. And he has come along. He's raised up an army of people to help us to love these people through their donations, through volunteering, through prayer. And it's all glory to him. And then I see the women as they move out of the program and they continue to spread the gospel with the greatest evangelism, like they are on fire for the Lord. They'll tell anyone that will listen what God has done for them. So thank you so much for supporting us. Thank you, Kim. It's pretty neat to be part of that. So uh, uh, thank you for coming and joining us here this morning. So anyway, let's uh, bow for a word of prayer this morning. We'll get started. Jesus, thank you so much for your many blessings you've given us. Lord, thank you for each and every one here. Lord, as um, we start another week, I just ask that you be with the area businesses here. Lord, I ask that you be with their employees and just um, everything they've got going on. We ask for your protection. Lord, we know we've had um, some tragedy going on this in this community yesterday and, and around. Lord, I just ask that you be with them families that have lost loved ones. We ask that you would be near and close to them, and, and we ask that you would lift them up. Lord, I also want to thank of the students as they go back to school again, the college students. Be with them as they study another week, and uh, be with their teachers, coaches, faculty that they're involved with on a day-to-day -day basis, Lord. And Lord, I just um, thank you for them. And Lord, I just want to lift up uh, Jeremy and, and the worship team also, Lord, as they lead the service later on here. Again, we thank you for your love, your grace, and mercy that you share with us each and every day. In your name we pray. Amen. If the kids want to come up, Rhonda. Good morning. How is everybody? Are you tired? Okay, make room, make room. It's so good to see you all. My goodness. Well, guys, I want you to think. Raise your hand if you can think of something that we are all using right now. Air. We're using air. The church. The church. Our, minds. Our minds. Our eyes. Oh, my golly gracious. Good job. Well, guys. Even when you're not thinking about it, you're using your eyes. You're using your eyes when you read, when you cross the street, when you watch TV, when you play ball, even when you're doing your homework. Now, if you were blind, you'd have to have help. You'd have to depend on others for help, wouldn't you? Would someone like to be a volunteer? Come here. Okay. <coughs> Let's see what I've got here. You want to be my volunteer, Evie? Okay, turn around. We've kind of done this before, didn't we? <laughs> A little bit different this time. All right. Can you see anything? Only on the ground. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, let's cover those eyes really, really good. All right, how about now? You still can see a little bit of me. Okay, why don't you stand up? All right, turn around right towards everybody. Good job. Now, what's it like being blind? It is hard to see and hard to walk. Now, if you wanted to walk around, what would you need? You'd need someone to help you. So, I need a leader. Who wants to be a leader? Come here, Kendall. Come on over. All right. Do you think you could lead our volunteer around? No. You couldn't? Why not? Oh, no. Okay, let's see. Brooklyn, come here. Thank you, Kendall. Okay, Brooklyn. Do you think, come on over, you could lead our volunteer around? You think so? Okay, you guys. But wait a minute. I almost forgot something. I've got a blindfold for you, too. <laughs> Turn around. Okay, let's get him over those eyes. Okay, can you see anything? Okay, Brooklyn, do you think you could lead our volunteer? Do you think you would want Brooklyn to lead you when she's blindfolded, too? Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> well, guys, would you trust somebody to lead you if they couldn't see either? No. no. Yes. Oh, my goodness. That'd be awful hard. It might not work. All right. Let's take those blindfolds off. Thank you guys so much for helping. You're welcome. Good job. All right, guys. It just might not work. Do you remember when Jesus called some men blind guides? He said, how can one blind man need lead another blind man? They will both fall into a ditch. He was talking about the Pharisees. They were supposed to be the leaders of the Jewish people. And Jesus was angry because they weren't telling people the right things about God. They were leading the people in the wrong direction. That's why they were called blind guides. That's why they were like blind guides. <coughs> blind guides just can't be trusted to lead us very far. But raise your hand if you know who we can trust to lead us. Our parents. Who else? God, that is right. Anyone else? The Bible, that is right. Who else? Maybe our teachers and our pastors. And, like you said, who can we trust with all the time? God. We can trust God. God will never lead us in the wrong direction. Raise your hand if you've ever been lost in a big place like a ballpark or a supermarket or a store, have you? How scary was that? Oh, three times. Oh, my goodness. That is pretty scary. I bet you would feel afraid. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, I bet that was scary. You know what? I think everyone feels lost and afraid sometimes, no matter how old they are. Listen, there are times when we are like a blind person in need of a leader. Jesus tells us to turn to God and to trust him as our leader all the time. Now, guys, who knows us better than God does? Nobody. He knows us even better than our parents or our best friend or even better than we know ourselves, doesn't he? Listen, he knows us through and through because he made us. He knows us. He knows what we need even before we ask. 
God knows what the future will be like, so why not let him be our leader? We can always trust him to guide us. So guys, should we bow our heads and pray? Dear Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that we don't have to follow a blind guide. Thank you for Jesus who wants us to have the best guide possible, who will always lead us in the right direction. We will always trust in you, God. In Jesus' name we pray, and all God's children said, Amen. Thank you guys for coming up. Uh, before we headed further into worship, I wanted to invite two and a half college graduates up. Arista counts as a half because she's going to do her student teaching down in Kansas City and then she'll graduate in May, but uh, this will be her last Sunday morning with us. So Isaac, Arissa, Justin, you guys want to come up here? I want to give them each a minute to just kind of share where they're going, what they're doing, and then... Um, Pab and Terry and Julia and Reese and I have been doing the college ministry there and invite them and other Reese and Nate to come up and pray with them before they head out. But I'll let you guys tell your story. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Isaac. I've been a student here at Graceland for two and a half years. I just want to say thank you all for everything you've given us during our time here. It's truly been a blessing to have your guidance and wisdom and counsel. Um, I am a Ag Business and Business Administration major, and come January, I will be starting my new position in Peoria, Illinois at Caterpillar. So. Hey everyone, um, my name is Justin, and I just want to be able to like just thank all of you for just allowing me to just be a part of like this wonderful church, and I just like want to be able to encourage y'all to just keep being a light for other people around the world because we all need it, and um, it's a big part of my life and why I want to do everything. So um, I will be graduating, and I will be going back home with a um, psychology degree, and my goal is to be able to go back, be able to counsel people and just be able to help because I feel like a lot of people in life just run to drugs or may run to sex or whatever it may be in life because they feel alone and they feel abandoned and they don't feel loved anymore, and I want to be able to give that hope to people. And as well, I'll probably be working with um, FCA. It's a fellowship of Christian athletes. And um, one of the lead people, been, he been wanting me to do it for a long time. And I told him I'd do it when I graduate. So that's my goal. Hi, I'm Arissa. Um, I'm moving back home, which is outside Kansas City. I'll be student teaching at Peculiar Elementary with fourth graders and also a special ed elementary. Um, and I also just want to give a big thank you to all of you for always making us feel welcome and loved and also for keeping us in your prayers. I get the impact team and lead, or elders to come up here. We also have just a devotional for each of you guys as well. Justin also uh, was telling me that he's the first college graduate in his mother's family, and so it's a pretty big accomplishment. <laughs> Heavenly Father, it has been quite a blessing to have these three in our lives and to see them grow and change and see the way that you have used them in their own unique way at Graceland. We pray that you would prepare the way for them, the places to go, the jobs to take, the friends that they need, the home church that they need to pour into, the ministry opportunities, the strangers that need to become friends, and the people there to share the gospel with, people there to take under their wing and disciple. We pray that you would protect them from the attacks of the enemy, from fear, from loneliness, from his lies and instead that they would continue to follow the truth and continue in the journey of maturity that you have brought them on thus far. Thank you for the blessing they have been to us, the way that they have used their gifts to help out with worship nights or morning worship or helping with Sunday school and the leadership that they expressed on Graceland's campus as well. 
Thank you for the good gift that they are to us. Would you help us launch them out in your blessing? For it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. All right, worship team, you're up. Good morning. Welcome you to time of worship and glad you are here and came out today. And I just invite you to stand and sing with us as we sing and uh, worship God together. And, uh, today's uh, kind of theme and focus is focused on the heart. And I, I don't know how many times, you know, the heart has a lot of purposes, but also um, from your heart flows your, your motives, your actions, and what you're thinking. And it's something to be protected, not only health-wise, physically, but also uh, what are we bringing into our lives, and what's our purpose, what's our motivation, and how do we how do we guard our heart to continue to grow to be more like Christ, and uh, reach others and help others, and, and um, you know, saying garbage in, garbage out, or you know what are we what are we filling our heart with? In Proverbs four, uh, verses twenty through twenty-three, um, James has that. Son, pay attention to what I say. Turn your ear to my words. Do not let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart, for they are life to those who find them and health to, the, to one's whole body. Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. And today as we sing and uh, worship together, I just want to encourage you to pour your heart out to God. Let him hear um, what's on it. Uh, he, he can handle that. And uh, whether you're broken, whether you're praying, um, I just want to encourage you today to keep focused on God's word, keep God's word center, and uh, continue to feed your heart, feed your soul and mind uh, through his word, and let his word guide you and uh, direct you. So this is what we're going to sing about today. I just want to encourage you, and we're going to be also making a little bit of a transition to some Christmas stuff too, so... Uh, it's the time of the season for that. Hope you all enjoy it and uh, worship with us. <laughs>
never gonna let, never gonna let me down. You're never gonna let, never gonna let me down. You are good, good boy. You are good, good boy. You are good, good boy. You are good, good boy.
Good morning. We're in Matthew chapter 15 this morning. When we last left Jesus and the disciples, the disciples had come through an arduous night of storm. 
and Jesus went out to meet them on the water and stilled the storm. And in that show of power and that show of affection and compassion towards them, they bow down and worship, realizing that Jesus is not just a good teacher, not just a moral man, not a crazy guy who can defy gravity, but is truly the Son of God. And remember who these guys were. They were just, they were just normal people, blue-collar workers, probably with minimal religious required education from when they were little. They weren't scholars. They weren't Old Testament experts. They didn't run the synagogues. They weren't vying to be the next religious leader of their community. Blue-collar guys with blue-collar jobs, probably with wives and children, just trying to pay the bills and wondering in the back of their head when Messiah would come. And he came. He came and he called them to come and follow him. To follow him during good times and to follow him during very arduous times. And in the process of following him, they saw more and more of who he was. In the beginning, it's like, come and follow you, okay. We're going where? Okay. We're going where now? Okay. And through that process, understood more and more of who Jesus was until we have this moment of revelation. But at the same time, as we come into 15, we find religious leaders who are the, the creme de la creme, the, the top of the pyramid when it comes to religious institutions in Judaism, making their way from Jerusalem down to Galilee, not a short journey, roughly 90 to 100 miles, coming down because they have heard these rumors of Jesus. And something needs to be done now. The local people have made their crack at it, and now it's time to bring in the heavy hitters from Jerusalem. So in verse 15, chapter 1, then some Pharisees and teachers of the law came to Jesus from Jerusalem, and they asked, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? Why don't they wash their hands before they eat? Now, doesn't this sound like a waste of time and energy? You've come 90 to 100 miles on foot, and you have 90 to 100 miles to go back. And the question that you want to start off with is, why didn't your mama teach you to wash your hands before you ate? Now, really, it's not the same thing, because this isn't about germs. This isn't about the fact that you've used the bathroom, and now you're about to eat using common utensils. This is about ceremonial washing. Ceremonial washing that is not indicated in the Old Testament that was only required of priests serving in the temple before they partook of eating food that had been consecrated to the Lord. And yet these religious leaders over a period of time, probably from the time of Ezra to present day for Jesus and his disciples, have expounded upon what the Old Testament has to say. And they're thinking, you know, it's not enough to stop something. We've got to stop it way out here. Now, I'm not a fan of sharp drop-offs. Grand Canyon and Jeremy don't really go hand in hand. My children do not share this same healthy fear. So when we come to a cliff, they want to run right out and look over it. And dad's about 50 feet back here like, get back over here. This is how the Pharisees and teachers of the law felt about the Old Testament felt about the laws that were there. You know, the law is there, but, but people get so close to it. We need to pull them back farther. So we will make new laws, new rules, traditions of the elders that people need to follow in order to keep a safe distance. So if the priests need to wash their hands in a ceremonial fashion before partaking of sacred foods, then probably everybody should wash their hands before they eat anything. And so they began this. It was not about germs. It was not about microbes. It was not about whatever you've been working with. It was all about ceremonial cleansing. And so their issue with Jesus is why do your disciples disgrace the teaching of the elders? Why do they break with their tradition? He's not saying why do they break the law, because they're not. 
tradition. I forget what the name of the uh, musical that was that was in town last year. Um, but it's basically kind of set in a, oh, Fiddler on the Roof, that's what it was. And they have this whole song that's tradition, talking about why do we do these crazy things that we do, and we do it just because it's tradition, because those who have gone before us thought it was a good idea, and we continue it even though we have no idea why it is we're doing it. And that was the question of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. Why are you messing with our tradition? Why are you not falling in line like a good Jewish boy, good Jewish man, and doing what you're supposed to be doing. Jesus, meek and mild, replied, and why do you break the command of God for the sake of your traditions? Everybody assumes that Jesus was like super nice, roll over. Jesus was firm. Jesus would call a spade a spade. And he was not going to roll over for these people no matter what their position was, no matter what rank they held. Because they're saying that the traditions of the elders supersede the word of God and Jesus brings them right back to where they need to come to. And why do you break the command of God for the sake of your traditions? For God said, honor your father and mother and anyone who curses his father or mother must be put to death. But you say... You say that a man, a man says to his mother or father, whatever help you may otherwise be receiving from me is a gift devoted to God, then he is not to honor his father with it. Thus you nullify the word of God for the sake of your tradition. So there was a, a word that was utilized to denote something that was set aside for the Lord, that was considered sacred to him. And this began within offerings and sacrifices, but then people extended it out into other things. And the word was korban, set apart for God. And Jesus is saying, it's a great idea. A great idea that God would give you some sort of blessing, whether that be a child, whether that be monetary, whether that be a field or an animal that you want to set apart for God's usage. But he said, the way that you have taken your elder rules, your traditions of the elders, and you have taken this and you've made it a giant loophole that young men and young women who in that tradition were supposed to take care of their aging parents, back before having social security and 401ks and retirement plans and Roth IRAs, people had a lot of kids. Because someday... These parents were going to get old. We're not going to be able to take care of each other. And there's really no assisted living facility to go to. So when they are no longer able to take care of themselves, it is now the responsibility of the children to repay the kindness that the parents have shown them and take care of them in their latter years. However, there were some people within Judaism who were saying, you know, mom and dad, I would love to help you out. I know dad's too old to work. And I know you can't pay the bills, but all this extra money that I had set aside that I was going to help you with, well, I dedicated it to the Lord. So now I can't use it to help you guys out. Sorry, maybe hit up another sibling. And Jesus is saying, you let this happen. You allow people to play this religious game because it's in keeping with the traditions of the elders. But what it's really doing is nullifying the word of God. And it still happens today, where we play games with our traditions, with our preferences, with our wants, and we try to put our wants on par with the Word of God. We see this happen perhaps more vividly and visually within more traditional religions, where we see Gothic structures, we see vestments, we see these are the hoops you need to jump through for different sacraments. But this is just as much alive and well in our lives today where we take our preference and it needs to be done our way. Because that's right. Well, that's what we say. My way is the right way. Otherwise, I would have a different way, which would also be the right way. Rather than saying, what is God's way? What does the word of God say about this particular situation? 
Jesus pushed back against them rather hard. And then he pushes even further. You hypocrites. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain, and their teachings are but rules taught by men. So what Jesus is saying is what Isaiah chastised his generation with, this attitude of hypocritical nature where you come near to God with words, with things that come out of your mouth. Maybe you're a very energetic worshiper. Maybe you like to lift your hands. Maybe you're a clapper. Maybe you like a little bit of dancing while you're doing it. That's great. That's totally fine. But if the sum of your worship of God is that, and it is not accompanied by a purity of heart from which that worship flows, you're wrong. But if you're not an energetic worshiper, don't think that you're off the hook here. Because if your idea of worship is, I just, I just want to be quiet, I just want to mouth the words, I just want to be here in the moment of the song, and your heart is not right with the Lord, you are not drawing near to him, you're wrong also. Jesus is saying and quoting Isaiah that a hypocrite is one who puts on a mask, who pretends to be someone who is a different individual when they are in the presence of the people of God than he is when he gets in the van and goes home, than he is when he's at work. And it is possible to pull the wool over the eyes of people and be a tyrant at home and a saint in the gathering of the body of believers. But there's no fooling God. And Jesus had these guys' number. They honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. You can say whatever you want to say. And you can say it very eloquently, very powerfully, very sincerely. But the heart, which is the seat of affection and emotion and thought, that's not so easily pretended. And it is only the heart that be can be transformed by Christ Jesus that can be made new, that can be made whole, that can be transformed. A heart of stone that it's talked about is removed. The heart that we had when we were born, when we walked in sin before hearing about the newness of life we could have in Christ Jesus. And then a heart transformation happens when he removes and breaks our heart of stone and gives us a heart of flesh, a heart that beats in time with his, that gives us the ability by the power of the Holy Spirit living inside of us to walk after him, to pursue him in righteousness. That newness of heart cannot be faked for long. Although some of us would rather do that because it's easier. It is easier than having our stone of heart crushed and removed it is easier than allowing Jesus to sit on the throne of our lives. That's our place. That's what we want. And so we fake that he is there. But in all reality, we are the one who continues to remain there calling the shots. He says their worship is in vain. They can say the right words. They can know all the words to the song. They can sing them out loud on key better than anyone else in the room. And it's still vanity. Vanity. It still amounts to nothing. There is no resounding echo in heaven above. It's like it just bounces off the ceiling and comes back because the heart condition, whether they are on the stage or in the congregation or watching online at home, it doesn't matter. It is vanity if the heart is not right. And Jesus says that vanity ties into the fact that their teachings are but rules taught by men. We see this in a lot of places that we would call denominations or sects of Christianity or other religions, ideas where somebody had a vision, had an idea, had an appearance, wrote sacred scripture or something like that, and then told everybody, you have to follow my rules. You have to follow my rules because they're not really mine. God gave them to me and I jotted them down on a little post-it note and this is scripture now. And they can be very convincing with it. 
But he said the reason the worship is vanity because these people are following rules. They're following the traditions of the elders rather than the word of God. And we're such, in such a blessed place in today's day and age with having scripture in whatever version you want an hour and a half away at the Christian bookstore. It could be delivered to your house from Amazon in probably less than 48 hours. Have it on your phone instantaneously. And yet perhaps the most biblically illiterate generation that has ever been raised up. It is not for lack of opportunity. It is for lack of desire. And the newness of heart needs to crave this. The disciples were to be entirely different than these religious leaders who came and knew the word of God forward and backward. They were to know the word of God as well, but they were to live it. They were to live it in the power of Christ Jesus. And they were to live it authentically from their heart, not just through actions. So Jesus turns from these religious leaders who have tracked to interrogate him and turns to the crowd and says to them, listen and understand, what goes into a man's mouth does not make him unclean, but what comes out of his mouth is what makes him unclean. And this had to be, what? For so long they had been taught by their religious leaders, don't touch, don't taste, don't partake of that. Why? It's going to make you unclean. And so cleanliness, ceremonial cleanliness was all about following the rules, jumping through the hoops, doing what you were supposed to do. And Jesus says this isn't about things that you touch. This isn't about food that you partake of. Rather, it's about what comes out of your mouth. Your mouth, whether you are in your right mind, whether you are in an emotional fit of anger or rage, your mouth is the thermometer of what's going on in your heart. And it tells people around you what's going on in there. If your response to things is anger, is frustration, is rage, is disappointment, if you are quick to speak and communicate all of those disappointments that you have in life to the people that are around you, it communicates to them a lot more about your heart than it does about what they've done. Now, that's not to mean you can't have a jacked-up heart and just have a better zipper on your lips. Some people do that well, too. But whether you are imploding silently, and instead of it coming out your lips, it's just playing through in your mind, or if it's actually coming out like a fountain of anger, of fire, meant to destroy, meant to hurt, meant to convey your displeasure. It tells us that the problem we have isn't that you just need to think through better what you're going to say. We have a heart condition that needs to be dealt with. Then the disciples came to Jesus and asked do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this? See, being offended did not start with our culture today. These religious leaders were offended by what Jesus said to them, and yet we know Jesus lived a sinless life. So being holy, being Christ-like, does not mean you're not going to offend anybody. And it also means that we do not have the right to go through life unoffended. The cross of Christ is offensive. Truth is offensive. To people who cho choose to live according to the way of the world, what we do and how we live is offensive. Does that mean you need to be silent in order that the rest of the people around you be not offended? No. No but it does mean you need to be wise in the usage of your words. And the disciples come to Jesus because they saw these religious leaders from Jerusalem whose names they probably know because they were probably a big deal. And when they would trek up to Jerusalem for the holy days, they would see these men talk, possibly hear them teach, 
hear their names, watch them walk around in their flowing robes as they presided over the temple. And they're probably like, Jesus, do you know who you just said that to? Like, he's, he's a powerful man. And he was offended by what you said. And Jesus replied, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be pulled up by the roots. Leave them. They are blind guides. And if a blind man leads a blind man, both will fall into a pit. Jesus is referring back to his earlier parable where the owner of the field went out and planted. And then at night, the enemy came by and planted weed seeds. And then as things began to grow up and there began to be a disparity between what was truly wheat and what was actually a noxious weed, the workers came to him and said, I thought you planted good seed. And his response was, I did. An enemy has planted this other stuff. What Jesus is saying about these Pharisees is that they are not a planting of God, but they are a planting of the enemy. And because they are a planting of the enemy, and because they have cast their lot with him, and they have had the Son of God there speaking truth right in front of them and chosen to harden their hearts against that, that they are no longer to be spent time with. They are no longer to be the people that you seek to try to convert. This idea of leave them is an incredibly powerful statement of judgment about these men. No longer bother them with the good news of the gospel. No longer pursue them by telling them that I am the Messiah, the promised one. No longer go after them and tell them that I am the Son of God, come to save sinners. Leave them. If that's the direction they want to go, if that's the place that they want to be, if that's what they want to think, if they want to be offended rather than push through the offense to find the truth, let them go. What a frightening word to hear. If we don't respond to truth when it's presented to us, if we don't seize the opportunity to make changes and transformations and to have our heart soften to the gospel, what if someday when we are so convinced that we are on the right path, that God says of us, leave him, let him go his way. Those are incredibly frightening words. And when we look at this transition, I think all of us cheer a little bit with Jesus, like, man, he talked truth to power, and they look like idiots, and it was awesome. A lot of us want that job. The job that we don't want is the one where we allow our heart to be broken by God Almighty to be broken in the tenderness of his hands, to teach it to break after the things that break his own, to watch our idols break, to watch the things that our heart had had such strong affection for be shattered, to watch dreams that we were so confident that God had for us fall to the ground because that was just an idol. It wasn't truly what he had for us. to have been hurt and deceived by blind guides in the past and yet to be called to not allow our heart to get hard because of that experience, but to once again be vulnerable to the word of God and to the Lord's teaching and so soften our hearts once more and follow after him. That's not the job any of us want. Just let me say the sassy thing and walk away. Don't tell me that you want to do the hard work inside of me. Don't tell me that the places we are going to go are going to be hard and challenging and break me and shatter me, but that you will bring me through on the other side looking more like Jesus than I did before I went through that process. This idea of blind guides is ridiculous as... Rhonda brought out this morning, as ridiculous then as it is today. 
A blind person comes up to you and says, I know I can't see, but my not seeing is better than your not seeing, so let me lead you. And then they both fall in the hole together. Be careful who you listen to. There are a lot of people who are offended, who have a better way of doing things, an easier way of doing things. Things would be, oh, so much better if they just got their way or got power. And they'll try to bring you along. Follow me, be a part of my sect, be a part of my group, be a part of my team. Vote for me. You're going to end up in the same hole. Have the word of God firmly open in one hand. And follow other people who are pursuing the word of God with your feet. Let it do its work in you. Amongst people who are allowing it to do its work in them. And be transformed. Then as an aside, as they leave behind the crowd, Peter says, explain the parable to us. Jesus' response is not terribly flattering. He says, are you still so dull? Yes. Yes, I am. Now, we don't know if this is, Peter, by now you should get this. Or we don't know if this is kind of like the kid who needs help with his homework and comes up, can you help me solve this problem? Okay, here it is. And the next one, and the next one, you need to do a little bit of the hard work of grappling with what does this mean rather than just jumping to the answer key. And so I don't know if Peter was jumping to the answer key or if the development and transformation that led to a sharper mind and an understanding of these parables and these metaphors was what was lacking. Jesus responds to him, don't you see that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and then out of the body? Out of curiosity, I wondered how long does it take? Two to five days is the average transit time, depending on your particular situation in there, to go from eating to excrement. For myself, I think the only things that deviate from that are certain dairy products and really spicy Indian food, which shortens the transit time to about 20 minutes <laughs> and oftentimes requires flame retardant toilet paper. But Jesus is saying, whatever comes into you, it's just on its journey out. It's not going to hang out and make you unclean long term. But the things that come out of your mouth come from your heart. And these things make a man unclean. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, and slander. These are what make an, a man unclean. But eating with unwashed hands does not make him unclean. Jesus is saying it's not about jumping through the ceremonial hoops. It is about allowing the word of God to transform your heart. Allowing the spirit of God to make it new as you respond. And as a result, those desires that you used to have will become less and less. For some of you, it is a miraculous, it's gone in that moment. For some of us, it's an, I'm going to fight this. And I'm going to fight it again today, and I'm going to fight it again today, and I'm going to fight it again today, because I don't want that to be me anymore, because I've been there. I followed that route, and it was not leading me in a place that I wanted to go. And now that the Lord has changed the trajectory of my life by giving me a new heart, I don't want to be a part of that anymore. It's no longer what you touch. It's no longer what you eat. It's about what comes out of you. And God's desire for each and every one of us is that we would be made whole and we would be made holy and we would be made new and that our heart would beat with his and desire his things for us, his good for us, his holiness for us. Let's pray and then I have two announcements. Heavenly Father, we do pray that you would lead us and guide us in ways that bring about heart transformation in us. 
Not just that you would stop ridiculousness from coming out of our mouths, but that you would stop it at its source in our heart. Change our affections and place them upon you instead of lesser things. And if we've been hurt in that way in the past, give us the courage to press forward because you are trustworthy and faithful. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Actually, I